So thank you uh, to those of you that have joined us. I'm going to um, introduce uh, Simon and, and Kerry in a moment. Maybe just just pray for us as we as we gather. And Father, I want to thank you uh, for this time together. Thank you for what Simon and Kerry have prepared uh, for us, and uh, that as we explore this uh, together, we pray that you would make your will known to us, that you'd inspire us, you'd encourage us, uh, you'd um, perhaps challenge us as well. Um, uh, lead us, uh, we pray, in this time together uh, for your glory. Amen. So, Simon and Kerry, do you want to introduce yourselves um, to us? And uh, and yeah, then I'll hand, hand over to you. Yeah, sure. Well, it's lovely to be uh, with you all. Uh, we lead a, uh, a Baptist church in the centre of Ipswich, and we've been doing that for uh, 28 years. And uh, during that time, we've gone through several uh, iterations or several seasons of the life and growth of the church. And uh, significant to uh, those seasons, to moving towards a model of uh, missional discipleship, where trying to empower uh, every member to uh, be a disciple-making disciple. Uh, the whole 5Q journey has been uh, super significant to us in helping us become a church that at least is attempting and seeking to express uh, the fullness of, of Christ rather than just kind of stay in the, the particular path of our tradition or what we've been comfortable with uh, to try and find ways to express the fullness of Christ. So that's kind of uh, why we're in the 5Q journey and why we're so passionate about it, because uh, we believe it makes a difference on the ground. And if uh, it doesn't make a difference on the ground where it really matters, then it doesn't doesn't make a difference uh, at all. So alongside all of that, we've uh, uh, grown a family and uh, we do some other bits and bats as well. Kerry, why don't you say a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, four kids growing, all growing, two married, one granddaughter, another one on the way. So it's very exciting, um, except for the title. We're getting used to being old. But other than that, it's amazing being a grandparent. Um, and uh, for us, we head up 5Q in Europe. And for us, I think it's a real just makes sense when you start to understand how it, uh, when you release the fullness of Jesus, how it actually brings uh maturity and the sense of ease and I also use um work in, in the business world a lot and I use a version of 5q in the business world as well Simon over to you right well um should we just um hear from from each of you on the call just a couple of sentences about who you are we we're kind of what what like, perhaps brings you to this moment uh, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll excuse Andy and Catherine because they're going to talk a little bit later on. But perhaps uh, uh, Stuart and, and Michelle and Aubrey would be great just to kind of like what, what's what's sparking your interest? What, what's what's brought you here? Can I go first? Yeah, please do. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, well, Aubrey's here because other thing, Aubrey and I work together. Um, uh, I work alongside Aubrey. So, um, as I was joining the Zoom this morning, he said, "Could he come in um, and hear what um, you guys had to say?" So, um, uh, so we have both just moved um from uh Frinton Free Church to here in order to mm -hmm. sort of do what is um essentially a very missional um work. Um obviously the free church is big and vibrant and um this is a little community-based village church just um sort of 10 miles or so down the road um uh with a um when we came here 13 members um mm -hmm. There's, as is with a lot of places, lots of um, little housing estates popping up around. So we've come here with a real sense of this is a new emissional opportunity. Um, and obviously, Mark um, has been engaged with 5Q um, already. So um, he's talked a lot about it and um, kind of sparked my interest. Um, and uh, I did quite a bit of reading around sort of that kind of stuff um, during lockdown. So um, yeah, I'm really keen to hear what you have to say and um, and be a part of that. So, great. No, it's good to have you on the call. And yeah, I chatted to Mark just a couple of weeks ago about uh, the, the all, all that you guys are involved in. Sounds super exciting. Great, great opportunity. So, <laughs> courage, courage you in that. Thank you. What about you, Stuart? So, um, been at Barnwell 18, 19 years. Um, been on the journey with Marley for about ten, um, and literally just managed to plant sort of the early part of this year, bought a house. Catherine joined the team 
um, last year. So she's been with us for a couple of years. She's in training at the moment, but with a vision to her becoming full time with us. Um, and we've been talking about kind of how we work as a team, what that looks like. Um, and at the start of this year, so 2023, we did a whole series around five, uh, sort of five fold. Um, mm-hmm. Got various people in who uh, operate in the prophetic, evangelistic, all their different gifting, just to just come and share their sort of stories, really, just to, not in a necessarily sort of a teaching, but more of a sort of expression of this is what we do, this is how it operates, just to kind of start to throw it into the life of the church to get peak a bit of interest really um and we're kind of then looking at okay where do we take this how do we take this forward now going going on from here so that's kind of where we're at really right well you're very welcome it's great to have you uh, on the call i'm just going to share my screen for a moment and uh hopefully that's doing what it should be doing And uh, what we're going to do uh, during our time is, is because it's a taster, we're going to try and give you a little bit of a taste of what it's uh, uh, being on the cohort is like. We'll say a lot more about the detail towards the end of the call, but just to give you a, a kind of feel and flavor. So there's there'll always be um, a, a lot of uh, new content, so something to think about and reflect on as our learning grows. But what we want to make sure that we do all of the time is to give time for that content to be processed kind of while we're together so very much a journey together of listening to to what we're hearing and then trying to uh, respond and and work it out so um it's quite interactive in that sense that's where probably the strength of learning comes from that interactive space otherwise it ends up being like you know your traditional kind of uh uh, conferency type environment where you write down a load of notes and you put them on the shelf and that's the end of it or at least that's often my story so we want to try and make sure that in the time that we've got together uh that's that would be quite boundaried um you know we want to respect everybody's time that there would be uh, a good amount of time for kind of processing thinking about it reflecting on it before you then go uh, and take away uh some learning and some application Okay, so we're we're gonna look at a little bit of content and have a little bit of opportunity to to talk about it. We're just going to introduce kind of 5Q at a sort of high level, uh, just to help. Uh, maybe you've heard all of this stuff before. Maybe it's new, but it's just an important kind of foundation and frame of a reference. I guess behind all the reasons that we might be on a call like this, it's that we believe the our church and we're all responsible for churches rather than organizations we believe that our church can become more alive than it is right now we believe that our church can express more fully who jesus is than it does right now we uh believe that uh there's a future that's more glorious that god's calling us into than the one that we know just at the moment and so this is what what we'd like uh, you to begin to think about as we share together this morning. Imagine a church that has attained to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What What's it like? What's that kind of church like? There's enough of us, uh, a few of us on the call just to, for us to be able to stay together and have a, a quick kind of conversation about that. But what what comes to mind when you think about a church that's attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ what's that church like how would you describe it and uh, these aren't now rhetorical questions so we're just uh, sort of a 30 second pause and uh, and then an invitation just to, to shout out what you think that church would be would be like it's having a significant and transformational impact on the community around it brilliant yeah it's a, it has a transforming impact great yeah Anything else? Although we'll take that. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? We'll have that. Let's do that, shall we? Whatever else we do, let's do that. That's good. First of all, having a love from for each other within the community, within the community of the church, because if you don't do that, you're never going to reach out and love the community and therefore have yeah. an impact on it. Yeah. So we'd have a, a culture of, of love that both within and without. It's vibrant and alive. Yeah. How might that express itself? Yeah. So allowing the Holy Spirit to really move powerfully. We'd expect to see more power, wouldn't we? We'd expect to see a greater release of the Holy Spirit. 
thinking about that love that you were talking about, Aubrey, a minute ago, we'd expect to see some kind of radical inclusiveness of the, the, the model equivalent of those that are on the outside, the, the, the lepers that Jesus included, the tax collectors that he called to redemption and so on. Yes, so, a, place of, a place of compassion. Okay, yeah. Servant-hearted, humble. Servant-hearted, humble. One of the one of the hallmarks of Jesus's ministry was that after three years, he had, uh, I was going to say fully functioning disciples, but he had disciples that were able to go on and make disciples. And if we did that every three years, that would bring about some change, wouldn't it? We did that with 12 people in three years. That would be an amazing thing that would transform our churches, whatever size church we are part of right now. So we're beginning to imagine and, and keep flexing. OK, we're beginning to imagine a church that has attained to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And it's that kind of church that Paul describes in Ephesians 4, the, the most famous passage that reflects the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd and teacher. And we're going to look at that passage in just a, a second. Uh, 5Q gets its name from uh, the, the kind of the IQ uh, kind of shorthand for intellectual capacity or intellectual intelligence. And uh, we've got EQ for your emotional intelligence. 5Q is your, your APEST uh, intelligence, your fivefold capacity as individuals, teams and churches. That's where the name uh, comes from, if you are still left wondering. So Ephesians 4, here we go. Uh, and an invitation to look at these familiar verses with soft or with fresh eyes. Uh, often we come to the scriptures with our own frame of reference and we only see what we can see through our own frame of reference. And, and that's been, in our opinion, a huge stumbling block uh, for us understanding these verses correctly and therefore missing perhaps some of the revelation that's in uh, the gospels themselves. We know that the book that was written to uh, the church in Ephesus was not just for them. It was a summary book. It was a guide book of church life that was going to be sent around all the churches in uh, Asia Minor. And so when Paul gets to the heart of his message in Ephesians chapter four, he talks about what's required in order for us to attain to the measure of the fullness of Christ, that question we were just talking about. So when, when you get to kind of a verse uh, 16 and onwards in, or, or in Ephesians chapter 4, he's painting this picture of what's required in order to experience that fullness. So what do we need in order to experience the church that we've just started to imagine? Well, the first thing that we need is unity. The unity of verses one to six of Ephesians four, when it talks about the seven ones and there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one baptism, one God and one father over all. We need unity. And that's been a, a very important rediscovery, hasn't it, over the last 20 years in the life of our churches we were fed up with what we could see as disunity. We were fed up of denominations and divisions and divides. And there's been a huge sense of rediscovering the need for the church to be united. Now, that's a that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, we need to hold that. We need to be faithful to that. Unity is super important. But unity alone, and this is where I think sometimes we've made a jump, unity alone doesn't get us to the place of maturity that we long to. What Paul describes in Ephesians chapter four is that we need the unity of uh, the spirit, but we also need the diversity that Jesus brings. We have the unity of the spirit and the diversity that Jesus brings. And, and Paul talks about the five postures or the five graces that we often talk of that Jesus gives to his church, the grace of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd and teacher. Now, these are postures. These are kind of modes of being, faces, if you like, and we understand them to be different, distinct from gifts and spiritual gifts, which are which we might be rightly set apart for. That these are more um, more embracing than that. These are kind of ways of viewing and interacting with the world. That the, they they describe the way that we engage with God, engage with ourselves, and engage with one another. 
And so we need the diversity of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd and teacher if we're going to reach the maturity that Paul speaks of uh, attaining to the full measure of Christ. We can't get to maturity without unity and diversity. But we've got stuck on diversity. This, I think, is where we've got stuck. And we've got stuck on diversity um, because we've said it's all about unity. As we've rediscovered the, the, the longing for the church of Jesus to be united, we've put that as a value so kind of boxed in that it's been hard to think about diversity because any talk of diversity sounds a bit like division and we're super nervous about anything that's going to divide us because we know how important unity is. But what we've tended to do because we've valued unity so much is that in order to protect that unity, we create uniformity. We create little ghettos where we all like the same thing. We all do the same thing. We all behave in the same way. And, and, and that uniformity is a way of protecting the unity. But that, that's not the unity of which the, the Bible is talking about. That's not the unity of the spirit. The unity of the spirit is united in Jesus and then finds expression in the diversity of who Jesus is. So we need to be brave enough to go, absolutely, unity is essential but we need to express the diversity of Jesus uh, alongside that unity. The second thing we've wrongly said is that it's all about pastors and teachers. The single person lifted above every other one in the church who makes it all happen and everybody else kind of shows up and pays up. And that's church life, isn't it? Historically, that kind of model of someone does most of it, if not all of it, and the others kind of are kind enough to cheer them on or cruel enough to criticize them in the process. That's kind of been a, a frame of reference for uh, for church life. And that kind of um, raising up of the single individual, we've not only raised up a single individual, we've also raised up single individuals focusing only on pastors and teachers. There's been no real investment over the years of apostle, prophet and evangelist. It's all been about pastors and teachers. And to be honest, even that's confused, isn't it? In, certainly in our Baptist environment. Now we're in it to win it. We love it. We serve in it. We're part of the whole Baptist kind of journey, longing for it to be express the fullness of Jesus. But equally from the inside, we recognize its struggles and its difficulties. And one of the kind of confusions that we can see is in uh, uh, just in, in my personal process. When I got a, appointed as the senior minister, they appointed me to be the pastor by assessing how well I taught them on a Sunday. So even the role of pastor and teacher is confused in our kind of understanding and in, in our, our approach. So we're, we're in a bit of a muddle with that that we need to rediscover as well. And then the third thing that we've wrongly said is that it's all about leaders. We've assumed that these postures that Jesus gives to the church are just for the leaders. Uh, and it says the complete opposite, actually. In verse seven, it talks about the grace given to each one, the grace given to everyone. So this is not about leaders. This is about everyone. This is about the whole body of Christ. And uh, if you just remember again the Ephesian context where, where Paul was writing these words, remember he was writing to people who were in someone's house, someone's front room, someone's courtyard. He was writing to a community, not an individual. It was written to all, not just to leaders. It was non-hierarchical. It involved all ages, genders, classes and ethnicities. Everyone was included in, in the mission. And Paul writes and says, hey, this grace has been given to everyone. Everyone's got a, a measure of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher in them, gifted in them because of Jesus. And I think it's really important for us to remember that Paul is not introducing a new idea here, but he's explaining what's already true, what has already happened. Paul's not saying, I've got this new idea. What about churches that have these five? Paul is reflecting on what's already taken place in the birth of the church. How do we know that it's all about unity and diversity, the diversity of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher? Because Jesus fully expressed this diversity. And what we're about, if we're about anything, is to uh, reclaim everything that Jesus was. And Kerry's going to help us see that now.
Thanks, Sai. So helpful. One aspect of the redemption of Jesus is the way that he gathers all the fallen aspects of Apest into himself and starts to reshape them and bring in each to that place of full maturity and given us a perfect example of each and all the five pieces of the puzzle reshaped in the fullness of Christ and actually when we look at the gospels we see Jesus embodying all five perfectly and with all of this it's all about Jesus and when we actually look at the gospels uh, it's great to go through and see Jesus embodying them because as the apostle he's the archetypal apostle in Greek the term apostle literally is the sent one and he is the ultimate sent one. He sent to start and grow a movement, to scale it and give it momentum. And that's what apostles do. They extend and scale things. They're future orientated and they love new and challenging tasks, starting things, expanding the kingdom. And as they start things, they establish uh, spiritual disciples, you know, sons and daughters to cultivate that community as they move on to the next things. They're the adventurers the entrepreneurs, the explorers, the church planters. And the questions that apostles ask are, you know, are we leading the people of God to accomplish his purpose? Because Jesus was always on the mission that he came here to do. He was the and is the ultimate apostle. But he's also the archetypal prophet, bringing trust, revealing and restoring things the way that God created them. And essentially, essentially, prophets are guardians of the covenant relationships that God has with his people. You know, pro the prophetic is passionate, con passionately concerned with living a life that's morally consistent with the covenant. It's that simple, authentic life of justice, holiness, righteousness. And there's a priority for them to listen to God. And they're particularly attuned to God and his truth for today and the holiness of God. They tend to question the status quo, the dominant assumptions we inherit from culture. And Jesus operated in all of those when he was overturning the tables and the temple. He was acting prophetically, standing for justice and holiness. And core question the prophets are, so are the people of God hearing his voice and responding appropriately? And Jesus was the ultimate prophet, calling people back to the real covenant, to holiness, to the connection with Father. But actually, he was the, also the archetypal evangelist. And, and it literally means the one who brings good news. And Jesus' whole life of ministry was about the good news, about sharing that. And evangelists are recruiters and people gatherers. They're infectious communicators and they invite and want to connect people to their cause. And they've got real insight into how to make the gospel sticky so that people can really grasp it. Often they love spending more time with non-Christians, but actually they want to help Christians to understand that there's a whole world out there and there's a whole job to do. Often outside of church life, evangelists are the salesmen, politicians, public relations reps, and they attract people to their course and they're zealous about it. But the core question that evangelists are asking is, are new people entering the kingdom of God? And that was the whole art of Jesus's ministry, to bring people into God's kingdom, to offer out a new reality, to connect people to the cause. But he was also the shepherd, the one who nurtured protect and grew people he was the caregiver of the community and shepherds focus on the protection and spiritual maturity of the flock they want to cultivate a loving and spiritually mature network of relationships and making and developing disciples and often uh, they have a lot of empathy uh, they have a lot of patience and they see needs, provide comfort and encourage others. And they just have that knack of speaking truth in love. They're good listeners, easy to talk to. And Jesus lived as a shepherd, growing, maturing those around him and still acts as our shepherd and guide in the way we live. Often with the shepherd, um, we have a view of it as not a movemental thing. But Jesus had a balance that he always brought of giving both truth and grace but invitation and challenge that brought movement to those around him outside of church they're often the counselors social workers in caregiving professions 
And their core question is, are the people of God caring for and showing compassion for people? Because Jesus is the ultimate shepherd. But he's also the ultimate teacher. You know, teachers are the one who seek and share truth. And they understand and explain. They're the communicators of God's truth and wisdom. And they help others to remain biblically grounded, to better discern God's will, guiding through wisdom. And they want to keep communities faithful to Christ's words. And Jesus was the ultimate teacher. He's the word literally become flesh. And I think teachers are often the easiest for us to capture because we've all experienced teachers or trainers or professors in our lives. But actually the core question teachers are wanting inside the church are the people of God immersing themselves in scripture and incarnating it. Jesus became flesh incarnate, the word living amongst us, the ultimate teacher. And as you start looking at the Gospels with a lens of APS, you really start to see Jesus living in all the dimensions. Simon. Yeah, so helpful as we think about uh, Jesus and why is 5Q so exciting for us? It's because we see it lived out in Jesus in the way that uh, Kerry was just describing. So well, where in the Gospels do you see Jesus being a, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a shepherd and a teacher? When you think of something in the life of Jesus and you identify him being in one or other of those, just shout it out. Jesus with the woman at the well, prophet. Yep. Yep. Uh, you're right when you say about your husbands and so on. Yeah. Same story will be the evangelist. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, both a, a teacher and a shepherd to, to some degree as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Shepherd dealing with somebody like Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Just thinking about the way that Jesus always wanted to go to the next village, the next town. But that's apostolic, isn't it? But yeah, sense territory. of being, sense of being sent, pushing out. Was a prophet when he shakes the dust off his feet and moves on, he de he's declaring something about people who don't respond. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just look at John four, if you want to grab your Bibles because it's a really familiar story, as we've touched on Jesus at the well and actually what's so beautiful about this passage is you really see Jesus operating in all five of the apest and and there's a beauty as you just see the natural movement within him from one to the other so it's embodying and moving through them so just as you look just where do you see him just operating in those just just shout it out as you see he had to so, go through jerusalem uh, through samaria in other words he's being sent yeah yeah because actually he didn't have to most people didn't go through samaria they walked around it Just, just before that verse three is prophet when the lord learned of this he left judea and went back once more to galilee yeah we see this sort of teacher don't we in the way that he opens up the scriptures about the well and the comparison between jerusalem and the location in samaria yeah As a shepherd, where he offers her water that she can't give to herself or find for herself. Absolutely, yeah. And being in that place at that time was a very shepherding posture, wasn't it? When the the people who no one wanted to meet with would come in the heat of the day. And the fact that she 
is a Samaritan, he's a Jew, and they wouldn't normally mm. speak to each other or have any anything to do with each other. He goes, he's gone out of his way to be with her. Sure, yeah. For the for the sake of time, we're going to move on, but I hope we're wetting your appetite. But if you if you sit with John chapter four, you'll see the way that Jesus moves beautifully and seamlessly before between all five. If and if you if you take one of them away from the story, the story doesn't work. And it's a reminder that the fullness of Jesus was present with the woman at the well. The great thing about that story, thinking about what we said earlier, is it led to the transformation of the whole village, didn't it? So as we talked about, um, you know, that longing for transformation, uh, because all, all five were present, all five worked beautifully and seamlessly together. And if you pulled one thread of the five, all the others would unravel uh, as as well. So this is this is the main main kind of um, idea that that we're, we're wanting to leave with you today, that it's all about it's all about Jesus uh, and we are the body of Christ. And when Jesus uh, 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 left us with his mission, then he left us to express the fullness of who he was. And he was the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd and teacher. So we would expect the body of Christ, the church, to express all five in equal uh, measure. All five were needed. And we are to carry on the mission of Jesus when he breathed on them and said, as the Father has sent me, so now I'm sending you. We, we, we're, we're called to go and do everything that Jesus did. And we can only do everything that Jesus did if we embody everything that Jesus was. And so we need all uh, five. And, and one of the reasons I think why we're so excited about it and why it feels so timely is that there's a lot of great stuff happening in our churches and there's a lot of energy and effort going on. There's a lot of exciting things, but generally people feel a little bit stuck, not quite seeing the fruit that they hoped for. And we think that this is one of the reasons why, because we get a little bit uh, stuck or, or a little bit of the kind of Jesus in us is distorted because we're not expressing uh, the fullness. And uh, uh, I'm going to ask Kerry, perhaps give us one example of that uh, how that plays out and where we get stuck yeah uh, the more you look into APES seeing it in God in creation embodied in Jesus given to the church it seems really simple but actually there are quite lots of ways it gets distorted it gets stuck so I can just think about two an obvious one we've all you know Simon's already alluded to is the way we train people uh, at its heart, the church is a missional movement, yet our training is generally to teach them to be shepherds and teachers. And then we ask them to lead a missional movement. And, and, and often that, that just creates a bit of stuckness uh, within that. But another way that it can get distorted is uh, because of the difference that exists between pioneers and developers. So the apostles, prophets, are pioneers, evangelists, straddle, straddle pioneer, developer, but teachers and shepherds are developers. So if, if you imagine the Wild West, a land that was unexplored, the pioneers were the ones seeing the empty, unexplored space as something to lean into, to explore. They're the ones who went, who struck the ground. And then the developers were the ones asking whether they were a little bit mad. <laughs> and actually, the pioneers would establish that rudimentary community. And then the developers would come in and start to put structure and infrastructure in place. And they would start to grow the community and make life happening. And as that was happening, the pioneers were ready to move into the next bit of land. And we need both pioneers and developers, but they speak really different languages. And that causes... Uh, often a distortion and are getting stuck because often the pioneers tend to live imagining more of the future will be full of the next thing full of enthusiasm and we'll come and talk about it but the developers are going to start start to feel overwhelmed and resistance it's not that the idea is wrong but the pioneers need to start with the why of the idea spend time in the why building reassurance explaining the how mm -hmm. they're still thinking of community because without pioneers, things stay static and lack movement. And without de de developers, things lack the structure needed for continued growth. And we really need each other, but there um, is a learning process that we need to go on, to go through to actually be aware and understand of the paradigm and learn to speak each other's language. Simon. Yeah, that's so helpful. And uh, uh... 
reminds uh, me and us of why uh, expressing the fullness is so important to keep us, uh, keep that movemental uh, space as we uh, chase after the fullness of Jesus and his heart. And, and what we see 5Q helping us with is to give us a lens and a framework for both individuals, teams and churches. It works at all these different different levels. So it's so empowering as an individual to understand the grace that's in me because it helps me understand the significant part that I have to play in God's kingdom. If God's placed a bit of the grace of the apostle in me, then that's exciting because he uh, believes in me. He believes that I've got something to offer because he's placed it within me and I can begin to find my place in the purpose and mission of God. It also helps me to understand why other people see things different to me. And as Kerry was just saying, the kind of difference between the, the, the kind of um, pioneers and the, the developers and that um, a sense in which we need each other reminds us that we do need each other and therefore helps me to have grace towards other people that are different from me. And uh, that's a big thing sometimes in our churches, isn't it, for us to have grace for people who are different, not just grace for them to tolerate them, but a grace that says, I need you in all your difference because it's only together that will reflect the fullness of uh, Christ. And also for individuals, as I uh, as I recognize the grace that's in me, it also helps me understand my path towards maturity, because whilst I might be uh, more apostolic by nature, I can't ignore being a teacher or a shepherd or an evangelist or a prophet, because if the call on my life is to become more like Jesus, then I'll need to learn to express those other graces as well. It also helps release latent potential at team level. Let me describe a scenario that perhaps you've been familiar with. There's someone on your team who's against every new idea that you ever come up with. And you can't quite understand why they're against that new idea, because they genuinely love Jesus and they genuinely love the church. It's just every time you suggest something that's different or new or of change, they go into some kind of anaphylactic shock about the whole thing and uh, default to a level of resistance that seems uncharacteristic because of their love for uh, Jesus. So uh, we had that scenario with someone on our team. It didn't matter how brilliant the idea was. And of course, all the ideas were brilliant, joking, but it doesn't matter how brilliant the ideas were. Always resistant, but love Jesus, long for the church to grow. Uh, and of course, she was a shepherd. So what was happening every time we introduced a new idea, she was acutely aware of the emotional responses of all kinds of people in our church. So she was reacting, you know, just she couldn't help herself because she was a shepherd. She was picking up instinctively, picking up how other people would be unsettled by the change, how other people would find it uh, difficult. And so she would react out of that feeling. But once she understood that she was a shepherd and that we needed all five and that her job as a shepherd was to care for the people, she suddenly was able to see that her role was not to react in the light of all that she could feel and sense from other people, but her responsibility as a shepherd was to help those people journey through the change. And I can remember the day that Penny dropped. Uh, I was in Canada, or we were in Canada, actually, and she rang up and she said, um, I've suddenly got it. It's my job to help all the people that are nervous to get ready for the change, isn't it? Yeah. And suddenly someone who was quite resistant became the gateway, the opener to, to new things and new new ideas. Uh, and that's what happens with all of these different uh, graces, all of these different uh, the apex postures. As we understand how they work together, it releases a whole new level of uh, cooperation and freedom in God's spirit. It's also important, finally, for churches, isn't it? Because if I was to describe your church, you would say, uh, you might say, well, we're a very pastoral church or we're a very... Uh, family orientated church or we're a teaching church or we're a whatever or we're a community church all of those things are brilliant and great but they kind of give away that we emphasize certain things about who Jesus is and therefore perhaps don't value or emphasize some of those other things as much and therefore the fullness of Jesus uh, eludes us just a, a final thought cares to give it a wider context and then we'll hand back to Simon yeah, I think the beauty of APES is that it isn't just for the church because it's at the heart of creation. Therefore, we actually see it in all aspects of life. 
And as I said earlier, I work in the business world and use APEST in the business world. And actually, uh, when what we see is when we do is that, that actually uh, the difference between pioneers and, and developers and actually helping them to learn to speak each other's language, to understand the value of each part and what they bring. When you start to really embody and embed those, uh, well-being goes up, productivity goes up, but also the bottom line changes, which actually isn't a surprise when you bring in biblical values into the marketplace. But actually, APEST unlocks the latent potential in the world, as well as the church. And that's such a powerful tool for us. Simon mm. Goddard, over to you. Great. Thank you, uh, Simon and Kerry. So um, I'm going to introduce or allow Catherine and Andy to introduce themselves. They've. This is. We're at the moment um, recruiting for our fourth cohort, our fourth Baptist 5Q cohort. So we've been doing this. This will be. We've, we're currently coming to towards the end of the third uh, cohort, and Catherine was in the second cohort, and Andy was in uh, the first cohort. So I'm um, going to give you a few minutes each just to tell us a bit about your experience and. Uh, yeah, we'll have some opportunity afterwards, perhaps for um, Stuart and Michelle and Aubrey to ask you questions. But um, yeah, Catherine first and then and then Andy, if you want to tell us a little bit about your experience of doing uh, the, the cohort. Thanks, Si. Um, I'm based in Havant, which is on the south coast near Portsmouth, if you're not sure where Havant is. We're a little town. We're on a um, a large, one. what was once one of the largest council estates, but um, more people have bought their homes since then. Uh, so the demographics changed. Our membership's um, just below 50. Uh, and I uh, had a... F um, I came on the 5Q journey two years ago now, so I did the initial um, first year's training and then have kept going with the alumni training as well. Um, and it's just been really eye opening for me to be able to have a lens and language um, to see the potential within our church um, and to be able to call call it out within people. And as Simon was saying, actually understanding um, where sometimes you rub up against people or understanding a conversation you're having and you might walk away and be able to reflect on that. OK, I've got a prophet in my hands here or I've got a shepherd, so we need to do X, Y and Z. Um, it's also helped as we've begun to shape new projects to ensure we've got the right mix of people within teams. Um, so I've not done any teaching on it yet. We did do the ones in Ephesians at the top, but we haven't gone lower than that in Ephesians 4 yet. Um, and slowly we'll work some more of this into the into the congregation as we go forwards. But um, it's great to be able to see it and call it out and we're seeing more growth and fruit coming and I think it's partly a fuller understanding of what the 5Q is amongst us. Great thank you Catherine. I'm gonna hand over to An Andy. Um, uh, Andy you you'll tell us that you're part of Fresh Streams and I just can you tell us a bit about how Fresh Streams has been involved in this as well and uh, sure. be helpful. Yeah hi thanks uh, my name is Andy Glover I'm based up in Chester a leader Baptist Church um, there, um, but I also am the team leader of Fresh Streams. And as you'll see, uh, Fresh Streams is partnering uh, with uh, Simon and Simon and Kerry uh, to deliver this. And um, really part of our desire to um, help to equip church leaders uh, in that whole area, which will enable yeah, healthy churches, just what Simon and Kerry were explaining earlier. Um, a church that sort of vibrantly reflects Jesus is the sort of heart that we're, we're after. And um, so we've really invested in this and, and uh, really promoted it. Uh, like like um, Simon was saying, this is the fourth, potentially the fourth cohort. And so I did um, the first cohort, I think it was. I think it was in lockdown time. So in some ways, actually, it made it a little bit easier for me to engage because life was not as busy. Um, and obviously using Zoom, um, was uh, was what everybody was doing in those days. So, uh, and and for us, it's um, at HBC. It's it's a really helpful. Um, I love that phrase that Simon uses about having soft eyes um, and looking afresh at this passage because we're we're a very sort of I guess 
a charismatic Baptist church, which had a particular view of the fivefold, which was much more about leaders and, and the sort of office. Um, and I think looking at this afresh has really opened up the sort of, yeah, that power for the, A, to, to see how it reflects Jesus. And so um, we talk a lot about being a Jesus-shaped people at HBC. And so this is just another great way of, of when you talk about becoming more like Jesus, you can focus very much on the character, but actually to become more like Jesus, you can focus then on the sort of competencies, the, the sort of skills to develop what it means to be apostolic, prophetic, evangelist, teacher, shepherd. So we, we've loved doing that. And it, and it helps us to sort of, the scenario that, again, Simon used, we do that a lot where we just step back and try and recognize that the lens and the gift that somebody's coming to this issue with. Um, it just helps us sometimes to, to resolve a little bit of conflict, just to help understand why somebody is looking at it in that particular way. It's not right or wrong. Um, and it's important to hear every voice. So yeah, it's, it's been really, really helpful. And um, yeah, I love that we can continue to work together to keep offering uh, new cohorts. Great, thank you, uh, Andy. What I'm going to do is just share a quick slide with some details of uh, what the cohort involves, and then we'll move into a time of, of uh, Q&A just so we can uh, respond to any questions you might have. Um, just, yeah, hopefully you can see uh, that screen there. So um, what's involved is from September, um, uh, this year to through to July next year, 18 hour long huddles um, taking place on uh, at 10 o'clock on Thursday mornings every couple of weeks during uh, that time. Uh, uh, Simon and Kerry and uh, some of uh, the previous cohort um, uh, are involved in the, the teaching of that and the facilitation of those sessions. There's comprehensive um, handouts. We record every session. so. Uh, uh, life happens and so not everyone's able to make uh, everyone they miss one or two over over the year and so they're able to catch up uh, using the recordings um there are practical assignments so there's a lot of, of questions about how it applies in your context and um uh, not forcing you to to run before you can walk but thinking and reflecting back um what small steps you might be able to take practically um based on uh, what you've been learning each session. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, um, as we go through and we uh, equip a number of people now over three cohorts, uh, there's opportunities uh, as you implement this to be part of the teaching team, to talk about what you're doing and uh, to reflect on it uh, with future uh, cohorts. Um, now, um, uh, you can see the costs there. Um, it would normally be 1,100 uh, pounds, I think it may even have um, gone up in some of the places um, uh, that this is being taught, but we're offering it um, at the same price um, that we, we started offering it a few years ago at 800 um, pounds for uh, the full year. But we, um, uh, uh, when we started this, um, uh, Baptist Union uh, gave us some grants to, to help us with this, and we uh, still have some funding available to offer bursaries. Uh, and uh, uh, we've got a couple of uh, context there where bursary is available for millennial leaders uh, for those in um, challenging contexts and uh, uh, and uh, perhaps those wanting to join the teaching team um, if if you think one of those three things might be applicable to you then we're able to offer a bursary up to 50 percent of the cost uh, of uh, the course so let me stop sharing uh, that screen and I'll send that information out to you and um uh, and the recording uh, of this session as well um, uh, to you and to those that were unable to make it today. But um, yes, Simon Kerry, um, Catherine, Andy, I'm guessing we're in the last sort of five minutes of our time together. This is time for, for questions. I'm not quite sure how you want to do that, or whether we just, uh, just open the floor. Yeah, very happy. We can linger yes. for a couple more minutes as well, if uh, that's helpful for people to chat. Go for it. So Stuart, Michelle, Aubrey, over to you. Yes, Stuart. Uh, so obviously in our context, we've got this on staff team, there's me and Catherine, but we've got two other leaders who are lay leaders. Um, how how do you work that out? Is it something that you would suggest that me and Catherine do or 
sort of the other ladies may not be able to do the daytime stuff. How how do you suggest that works out in in our con that will could work in our context? Yeah, sure. So we're 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 talking about culture change, which is kind of slow and uh, deliberate and intentional. And I, I guess we we kind of set it up so that um, the senior leaders begin to grasp the culture, begin to embed it themselves. And then often the assignments have a, uh, a second part. First part is about yourself, certainly in the early part of the year is about how does this relate to me? How does this relate to me as a leader? And then it moves into how does it relate to us as a team? And, and part of that part of that process is for you as the leaders to be taking that to your team. So uh, I guess the what, one of the ways I'd be interested to, to, to hear from from others that have implemented it in their churches. But one of the ways that, that that we imagine it working is that perhaps the two of you might come on the course, or one of you might come on the course, and then there would be a time for you to share it, pass it on to to the others, and to allow your learning to begin to to trickle into both your uh, relationship with them and, and for yourselves as a whole team. So you probably don't need all of you to come on the team or on the on the cohort, uh, but one or two of you that are responsible for changing the culture and can lead out in that. That's the key, really. So if, if, just come back on the follow up to that. I'm, I'm on sabbatical September through to November. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking I, well, I could do it as part of a sabbatical, which would be, you know, be OK. But obviously that means I'm going to be with Catherine. And if there's work to be done in between sessions, in terms of embedding that stuff, is that how again is that going to be a conflict with my sabbatical? Just being able to have a bit of a break from the church, or so I therefore think, do we? Yeah. I would say I would say those first beginning that there's a lot of taking on information for self and self reflection, and the the focus shifts towards pushing it out into the church so I would not think this has to conflict with sabbatical I think it can be something where you're using it for reflection of self um and then post Christmas we're starting to think more about how to bed in how what would others thoughts be around that um we've so we used to well we still do have a uh, thought before our, at the beginning of our leaders meetings and when I began 5Q it kind of shifted to a 5Q focus um, and it's now not always a 5Q focus but it will pick it back up um, so that's how I've worked with my leaders so that they're beginning this culture change and mind shift as well um, even two years on they still go mm, remind me of Apostle, what, what's one of those? What what do they want to do? What what are you trying to get at <laughs> me? Um, so it's slow. It's not necessarily that you've got to stand up and teach them everything that you have got from a session. Um, and I think a sabbatical where you can ground yourself in it a little bit might actually be really good um, before, because then you can work out which bits you want to take forward with who. Um, at the right time as you go back um so and that's about as far as i've taken teaching of 5q at the moment is within my leadership team uh, i am looking at a little group um but it it's not the whole church all at once yeah no i'd agree with both of those comments i think really really helpful i think stuart for me my tendency is always to to receive some information or receive something and go straight to team and church. And I miss out me because that's the difficult bit, but you'd have space not to miss out you, do you know? And that's important. Earlier on, Simon, you said that um, if you missed out one part of those five with Jesus, the story mm. of the Good Samaritan or that the Samaritan woman would mm. not be complete. Mm. Are you suggesting that we, perhaps as pastors in the church, develop all of those five things or allow the Holy Spirit to develop them in us? Or that we recognize those gifts within members of the church? Or are you suggesting both? Um, I'm definitely suggesting both. So, for example, you as the leader or pastor of the church 
pastoring might be your strongest gift. It might not be. You might be more apostolic or more a teacher or, or whatever. But in order, in order for you to lead the church in, a, in its whole sense, you will need to embrace all five in order to do that, because that's what the church needs. And uh, you might have particular strengths, but you'll also need to be conscious of raising up where you're not quite so strong in order for you to express the fullness of Jesus. Now, that's true of your team. And then it's also true of the whole church. So, for example, uh, on our team, we've got all of the APEST represented. But that doesn't mean that I can go, oh, I don't care about being evangelistic. Someone else is doing that. You see, so it, it's it's both and it needs to be in us because the way that I the way that I most honor the evangelists in our team is by honoring the evangelist in me, uh, even if it's not very well expressed or it's quite immature at the moment. But that commitment to see it uh, to see it grow. And I think one of the one of the things that is important in understanding the five Q journey is that is that it is moving away from the kind of solo leader and going well whilst, whilst it's my responsibility as a leader to grow all five in me actually there are other people with stronger competencies in some of these and i need to release them uh to do their thing in the life of the church and so it's definitely both and is that is that answering what yeah, you're asking sure. yeah just to jump in on that i think that would be my experience of reflecting on on the year i did the cohort was um, it's quite easy, isn't it, sometimes to identify your base gift mm -hmm. um, and, and then just live in that base gift. I think that's my strengths and that's there's some good to that. But actually to think how you develop the other four, that's not. And, and actually being a being a sort of an apostolic leader that has a strong prophetic development or a strong pastoral development, I think can really help. So I think that's one of the big shifts in my thinking was... Um, is to, to sort of yeah almost like right hand left hand type approach mm. isn't it so, yeah yeah really endorse that no that's helpful and we'll spend a lot of time during the call helping you see how your primary one is shaped by the others um there are quite a lot of insights that we'll share around that that's helpful i think any more questions uh, doesn't seem to be any more questions if you if you do um uh, i will be emailing you after uh, this session with a, a link to the recording uh, and you can send any questions for simon and kerry uh, to me and i'll pass those on um i'll also uh, uh as we uh, over the next sort of few weeks be sort of um emailing you and seeing whether you're up for this journey uh with us um and uh, we've got another of these taste fit events uh, on the 28th um so uh, looking forward to welcoming others uh, to be part of that so um yeah do do just keep in touch if you've got questions or you're like yeah i'm up for this let us know and um we'll um give you a list of the dates and you can get them in your diary um uh, straight away so i think we're we're coming to an end unless anyone's got anything they're desperate to say um it, could somebody sort of Pray for us as we as we uh, conclude. I haven't... Kerry, could you pray for us as we go? That be, Absolutely. That'd be brilliant. Thank you. Father, we want to thank you for joining with us this morning. Mm. And mm. we're asking for your clarity as we go and for your sense of direction. We just pray for each other and pray blessing on each other as we go. Amen. 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 Great, right, everybody. Thank you very much.